And so good morning, Heart of Worship Community Church. And those of you in live stream, what a blessed day that God has given us. It's the fifth day, right? December 5. And 20 more days. 20 more days and it's Christmas Day. Just like that. Well, I'm not going to prolong it. Uh, let's just go ahead and get uh, into the Word. If you have your Bibles, get them and turn them to Luke chapter 2, our text for this morning. Luke chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 1 to 12. And if you're able to stand, let us stand as we honor God in the reading of His Word. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, reading. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, even as we have read the account and the story of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent into this world to save us from our sins, Lord, may your word not only refresh our minds, but rekindle the fire in our hearts of not only why we have Christmas and why we celebrate Christmas, but even why we are alive, not physically, but spiritually, to be called your children of God. It's all because of Jesus Christ, whom you gave into this sinful world to be our Savior and even our Lord. And so let your word, O Lord God, as it was read, let your Holy Spirit now reveal it to us once again. And give us, Lord God, the understanding, even a fresh understanding and revelation of the truth, even of that first Christmas night. So that, Lord God, you may use us not only to celebrate and proclaim the the glories of Jesus, but to proclaim the good news to the lost, even amongst us or around us, our co-workers, classmates, neighbors, families, and friends. So, Lord God, this is our prayer that we ask for the glory and honor of your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You may all be seated. The title for today's message is more than a Merry Christmas. The title for this message, again, is more than a Merry Christmas. As I've said earlier, 25 more days, I mean, 20 more days, rather. Just like that, it's Christmas time. It's Christmas all over again. Now, what do I mean by more than a Merry Christmas. Well, the word Merry means to be in high spirits or be in a festive mood so that there's excitement and laughter. And of course, there's nothing wrong 
with having excitement and being in a festive mood. It's not a bad thing at all. I think that's, that's part of the being human and the blessing that God has blessed us with emotions. But I believe God wants us to be more than just have a festive mood or have excitement during Chris, Christmas. Because excitement, remember, is a feeling or a mood. And we know that feelings and moods, they come and they go. And that's why more than feelings and moods, God wants us to have joy. Real joy and lasting joy. That is to rejoice during Christ, Christmas and even after Christmas. Joy is an attitude. What kind of attitude? An attitude of gladness. In other words, God wants us to be glad. Yes, during Christmas and even after the occasion. Remember, God says for us to be joyful always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And of all people, we have really good reason to rejoice and to be glad, especially during the Christmas season. Why? Because of the reason. The reason for Christmas. We are glad not just because of the spirit of Christmas. The spirit of Christmas which is giving. We like that. We get excited about the giving. Maybe not all of you. Uh, but I'm sure we're all excited about the receiving part. Unfortunately for many, that's what Christmas is. The spirit of Christmas. And we have spent year after year rehearsing to ourselves that Christmas is not about that. Not about the festivities and all the paraphernalias, meaning the trappings or the furnishings, the peripherals, the stuff that for the most part has really has nothing to do with the true reason for the season, but has everything to do with making oneself merry, festive, and excited. Not for the birth of the Savior, but for the people I'm excited for the people I'd be with, the gifts that I can give or receive, or the food that I will be able to stuff myself with, and so on. In other words, Truth be told, for many, Christmas is just making self merry instead of celebrating and honoring and worshiping the celebrant, Jesus. Celebrating the birth of the Savior who is Christ the Lord. And we can certainly celebrate Jesus and His birth without any of what the world does. And last year, because of the COVID scare, we had a taste of not being able to celebrate Christmas in the way that we normally would. And now they're promoting a new scare, Omicron. Right? Like it's worse than COVID. We've heard the message of God, do not fear. As Christians, there's nothing that we should fear. That is not to say that we are not going to have the emotion of fear, but not to be controlled by that emotion so that we are frightened and fearful. We have the Lord who promised to be with us, who promised to protect us, and if He allows us to get sick of whatever sickness, He is there to heal us, and if He doesn't choose to heal us so that we physically die, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. This life, this is not it. And we have that perspective. We even have that word and the promise of God. So of all people, we should not fear. And so I think it was a reminder that we don't have to have the festivities to honor the celebrant and celebrate the birth of Christ. But isn't it more fun to have festivities? Of course. And I agree. There's nothing wrong with that. But the fun is... For us, is it not? And again, please don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with having festivities and having fun. I'm certainly not against it. But there's something very wrong when Christmas, or rather when Christians, when Christians cannot 
or would not celebrate Christmas if there are no festivities as though that is what the Lord is looking for. And there's something fundamentally wrong when our excitement for Christmas is the festivities and the stuff of the festivities and not the very reason for the season itself, which is a Savior is born. If that doesn't excite you that Jesus Christ was born, then your focus and reason is not Christ. It's the trimmings. It's the accessories of the season. And it shows that you are after making yourself happy or merry, which makes, again, Christmas just about you. If what excites us during Christmas are these festivities, that means Christmas is about us. But if what excites us about Christmas is the simple reason of the birth of a Savior, then we have something that God has blessed us with, and that is joy that will never be taken away. Because this joy is not based on or dependent on trees and lights and foods and gifts and peoples and the gatherings, which can all be taken away. They can all be taken away. But instead, our joy, our gladness, and even our excitement is just on the fact that Christ, the Savior, is born. With that reason, we can truly celebrate Christmas regardless of whether we have or have not. Whether we have the peripherals or the stuff or the extras or not. We can truly celebrate Christmas whatever the situation or condition in life we find ourselves in. Gifts or no gifts, lights or no lights, People or no people, party or no party, healthy or sick, COVID or no COVID, regardless of whether we have those or not have any of those, we rejoice. We have great joy, real gladness because Christ, the Savior, is born. That should be the only reason. Jesus is and should be the only reason. The rest they are just extras. That's the view we take. And if we take that view, corresponding actions will come. This is important because, listen, we eventually reveal whether we are a believer or not by the view that we take of this world, even Christmas time. How do we view Christmas? How do we view the world? Always through the lens of the scriptures, the Bible. We are to see life, to view life according to the biblical principles that God teaches us in His Word that ultimately will be seen in our attitudes, in our actions, in our lifestyle, especially in Christmas. In Christmas time, we see a world that is a people consumed by the things of this world. The focus is on the material rather than the spiritual. So much so that if people don't have the material, there is no Christmas for them. No excitement and no joy. It's just a, it's, it's dry, sad, and lonely because they don't see, as in literally see, what they're looking for, and don't have what they want in the world and what the world offers. Not believing that what they're all looking for is in Christ who was born. And so many, many pass away, especially during the Christmas time. This is what the Lord said in His Word. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, we read this before where it says, The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. If we live for the desires of the world that passes away, then guess what? We will follow that. We will also pass away. But if our desire is the desires of God, the will of God, then those who do the will of God will what? Will live. Lives. Not just exist but live 
It's one thing to exist. It's another thing to live. And not just to live for the moment or for a season, but to live forever. That's why for the believer, the material is immaterial. Yes, we thank God for the material blessings. But we still thank God even if there is none. The believer still rejoices because the believer knows it's the spiritual blessings and not the material blessings that truly matter. As Jesus said, you can have the whole world. But what does it profit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? The believer knows that it's the spiritual blessings that truly matters. If they have material goodies, that's fine. But even if they don't have, they still rejoice because of the eternal and spiritual blessings. The spiritual blessings of salvation that come through the greatest gift of all. The gift of God's only begotten Son, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Bible describes as God's indescribable gift, that is in 2 Corinthians 9.15. We can use all the adjectives that they know. And after using all those adjectives, there's still more of Christ. And along with Him, all the spiritual blessings. It's all in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says that. I guess I didn't put it there. But in Ephesians chapter 1, and i just like to read it for you. Where it says, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And that's why I have to remind ourselves every year, it seems, because we do forget. We do get distracted by the bright lights that glitter. We do get out of focus. I'm, I'm glad that the lights here are not glittering because we get out of focus and we get distracted. But we do get out of focus, especially with the uh, up to 70% signs, store-wide sales. We get out of focus with the excitement of the exchange gifts and all the other celebrations and the festivities of the world. Again, nothing wrong with that. Okay, but that's, remember, that's not what the season is about. If we're blessed with those things, thank God. But if not, we still rejoice. That's why we need to fix our eyes on Him to make sure that Jesus, Jesus is our reason for He is. He is the reason for the season. So how do we do that? By making worship of Jesus a big deal. Let us make the worship of the Lord a big deal. And the celebration of the world, not so big of a deal. What do we mean by that? Well, when we can't have any of the extras of Christmas, no big deal. Don't make a big drama about it. But not to worship and celebrate the Lord. Make it a big deal. What? We're not going to worship the Lord. Make it a big deal. We got to celebrate Christmas by worshiping the Lord. So on the eve, for example, on the eve or on the day itself of Christmas, gather your family and worship Jesus. How? By reading His Word, particularly those that give the account of His birth, like the one that we have this morning. Then sing songs about Him and sing songs to Him. Celebrate Him and pray to Him. Yes, you need, you and your family, let the, let the head of the household lead and have the rest participate in the reading and the singing and the praying. Go over the story of His birth. Unfortunately, I grew up, not unfortunately, but I grew up having that practice but unfortunately, I grew up with many of my friends that I know that to them Christmas Eve or Christmas morning is the, the unwrapping, 
And they're all excited. And after that, that's it. Let's eat. And after eat, it's a Merry Christmas. Where's the worship of the Lord? That's what I mean. Make, make the worship of the Lord the big deal so that if we don't have it, what are we doing? And so go over the story of his birth. And that's what we have this morning. The story of Christmas. And as we go through this, I pray, as I have prayed, that it will rekindle the fire in our hearts, the joy, even the excitement because of the birth of our Savior and the wonder of it all. The wonder of God becoming a man, born as a baby in a lowly manger. I pray that we will be glad to hear all over again, even though we may have heard this all of our lives growing up in the church. It's a story that should not lose its wonder, especially to the believer, for it is the greatest story ever told of how God, because of His love, came to save a world of sinners from their sins. And so it begins in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, where it says again, It came to pass in those days that the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Notice that word, it came to pass. This implies that this actually happened. This is an event in history. It is recorded. It can be verified. It is historical. In other words, this is not a myth. It's not a legend. It doesn't begin with once upon a time. But it came to pass. In other translations, in those days, as with any events in history, the event being mentioned begins with a decree, a mandate from Caesar Augustus, who is a Roman emperor that succeeded his great uncle Julius Caesar. Caesar Augustus is not his real name. His real name is Gaius Octavius. Gaius Octavius, but he took on the title Augustus. Augustus or August means majestic, as in awesome. Sublime, as in exalted. Wonderful, which it's a mistake for him to take it upon himself. Because the real awesome and wonderful and exalted one was the baby that was born that night in a humble manger. And so Caesar issued a decree thinking that he is the one who is going to control the imperial dictator despot of the time and decree that all the world, that is all the people, should be registered. In other words, it was a census, primarily for the purpose of taxation. And to add the validation of this historicity, of the historicity of the, the event, verse 2 says for us, the census was first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Another verifiable person, Quirinius, the one who governed Syria. And so as a result of this, verse 3 says, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. This obviously included Joseph and Mary, his betrothed wife that we read in verses 4 and 5. Joseph went up from Galilee to, uh, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child, meaning she was pregnant. That was, that's what with child means. And verse 6 says, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her, to be delivered. In other words, Mary gave birth. Verse 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Why is there no room for them in the inn? We don't know. Everything else that you hear, explanation, that's, that's all speculation. The Bible doesn't say why. But there was no room for them in the inn. And so the baby Jesus was born in a feeding trough. That's what it is. 
Not really a stable, but a feeding trough. Now, even though it's not explicitly stated, explicitly stated, what we need to see here is the sovereignty of God. God who is in control, who is able to work all things to accomplish His will, His plan and His purpose, particularly the plan of salvation that has been prophesied even from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Malachi. The prophecy about the Messiah and the Savior. And that is what we are seeing here unfolding as we continue in verse 8 and 9. Where it says, Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were, what? Greatly afraid. In the old King James, it says they were sore afraid. To describe the terror within them. I mean, wouldn't you? They're out in the field, dark. Then suddenly, from the sky, flying. I don't know if there were sound effects. I mean, you would be like sorely afraid. But then the angel tells them, verse 10, the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Even then, the message of do not be afraid, do not fear. You who are the recipients of the good tidings of great joy. Tidings mean news. You who have heard and received the great news, there's really no reason to fear. And I bring you this great news, the gospel of great joy, which will be to all people. And what is that? Verse 11 to 12. For there is born to you in this day, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Probably the reason the sign is given is because there are other babies born. But this one is wrapped in swaddling cloths. And so there it is, the story of Christmas, which is a good news of great joy. The story of Christmas is a good news of great joy. The great joy is based on the fact that the Savior is born. In other words, sinners can be saved. In other words, until sinful man experiences salvation, there is no real reason for joy or gladness. But it's not just joy. It is great joy, as in real and full gladness. The salvation that Jesus gives is so great and full, effective and complete that it even compensates for all the pains and hurts and all the distresses and anxieties of present life. How so? Well, that is what we will rehearse for us this morning as we now focus on verse 11 that we just read where it says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Notice that word born. What we have here, first of all, is incarnation. Incarnation. What is incarnation? It is God who became flesh, in other words, a man, by putting on humanity. As John chapter 1 verse 1 declares, in the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word, that is God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The incarnation, which is a mystery, a mind-boggling truth. God became a man. We hear it so many times that it doesn't, Strike a wonder in our thoughts anymore. But no matter how we explain it, it's a truth that we will never completely grasp because it's just too wonderful. Think about it. The Creator became one of His creatures. Think about that. 
The infinite God chose to be in a finite human baby. The almighty, all-powerful God became a helpless little baby that needs all the help from his mother. The omnipresent God is now confined in a human body and cannot be in two places at one time. The all-knowing God has to learn how to walk, how to talk, and grow in wisdom. The eternal Son of God humbled himself and put on flesh and became a man. And go through what we go through. Hunger, tiredness, pain, hurt, troubles, temptations, and everything that we go through, even death. That's why Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8 that we've read before, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking this very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the baby that was born in that manger. He was God, fully God. And man, fully man, both at the same time. Undiminished deity and true humanity in one person. And that is Jesus, the unique Son of God. There is no one else like Him. For in Christ, as Colossians 2 verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And so back to verse 11 of our text. For there is born, born what? To you, to you. This points to the personalization of His birth, of the Savior. In other words, it points to God's will, God's desire for a relationship with us. Think about this and remember this. God is not a force. Is that Star Wars? May the force be with you. No, God is not a force. He's not an impersonal being. He is a person and wants to have personal relationship with you and with me and, in, and with everyone else who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. For there is born to you. He looks at individuals, not a group. And, in, and the individuals he chose to give this good news of great joy were shepherds. Now, shepherds in that time were people who were at the lowest rung of the social ladder. They were actually in the level of sinners like the prostitutes. They were considered unclean and were despised and rejected and treated or looked upon with contempt, unworthy of respect. And it was to the shepherds that God directed this good news of great joy. To give them and everyone else the understanding that God wants to save sinners. And God could save and God loves to save sinners. Just like the shepherds that the society didn't care about. And if God can save such sinners, then God can save anyone and everyone else. God can save you. This is the reason Jesus came. To seek and to save sinners that is lost in their sin. As Jesus himself said in Luke 19 verse 10. For the Son of Man came to what? To seek and to save the lost. The truth is everyone needs to be saved. Because the whole world is a world of sinners. And we all need to be saved. Because we all have sin. And we are all lost in sin. Some sins are just more obvious than others but we all have sinned and that is why this is good news of great joy not just for the shepherds but for all people remember that is in verse 10 that we've the the angel said the angel said to them do not be afraid i bring you good news that will be cause that will cause great joy for what for all people why because all have sinned, as Romans 3.23 
declares. And so back to our text, for there is born to you. To you what? This day. This day points to an invitation. This is an invitation and specifying the day points to the urgency. The urgency of the invitation. I mean, think about it. Why did the angels announce it that day? The angels could have made the announcement to the shepherds one week after the birth or after a month or even months because Mary and Joseph and the baby were still in Bethlehem even after that night that he was born. Why make the announcement to the shepherds right there and then? Because remember, tomorrow is not promised. For the shepherds, nor for any of us. So that when God gives us an opportunity, that they may that that day may be the only opportunity. You know, only God knows our times, our days. Today is the day of salvation, as the Bible declares. So when God speaks and gives his word, and you hear his voice. You hear his invitation, especially for salvation. Accept the invitation today and not tomorrow. Because again, tomorrow is not guaranteed. As 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15 says, While it is... While it is said, today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. As in the rebellion of the Israelites who did not listen to the voice of God. So the text says, for there is born to you this day in the city of David. In the city of David. And every Jew knows the city of David is Bethlehem. So what we have here is the consummation. The consummation, in other words, the fulfillment of the prophecy that is found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, where it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And along with this prophecy, of the birth there in Bethlehem is the birth of the child that Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then in chapter 9 of the same prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. These prophecies and all the prophecies that matter, that had to do with the first coming of the promised Messiah, they were all fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Some people ask, why do you believe the Bible? Well, this is one undisputed reason why we believe the Bible. Because of the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. It was all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So there is born to you this day in the city of David a what? A Savior. A Savior. Pointing to our need for salvation. We need a Savior because we need salvation from sin. We need a Savior because we cannot save ourselves. We fall short. We don't measure up. No one does. Because of our sin, we are all condemned and doomed. We are all helpless by ourselves and hopeless in ourselves. We need a Savior. And the good news is, there is a Savior. And the Savior was born in that manger in Bethlehem, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, He is the only Savior who can save us from our sins. Money can save you. Good works can't save you. The church can't save you. 
any pastor can save you. A psychologist can save you. A doctor can save you. Politicians can save you. The government can save you. Religion can save you. A priest can save you. I can save you. I can't even save myself. There's only one name. One name by which we can be saved. And that name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Only Jesus. He is the Savior. As Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We all need a Savior. And that's why God sent us a Savior. To save us from our sins. Because sin is our greatest problem. And it is a problem that we don't have any solution for. You can kneel on your knees from the gate of the property all the way to the altar. God will not save you. So God sent us a Savior to save us from our sins. Because sin is our greatest problem. The sin problem is an impossible problem for us. And salvation from sin is our greatest need. And God knows that we can't save ourselves. And that's why He sent us His Son. And that's why the angel said, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. The Savior is born. There is a Savior. If our need was wealth, God would have sent us a financial accountant, a banker. If our need was health, God would have sent us a physician. If our need was education, God would have sent us an educator. If our need was happiness, God would have sent us an entertainer. But no, we needed salvation. We needed a Savior who will save us from our sin. And so God gave us Jesus. And that's why Jesus came, to save us from our sins. Not to save us from bankruptcy and make us wealthy. Even though God does that to some. Jesus didn't come to save us from physical disease and make us healthy. Even though God does that when we pray. But that is not the reason God came. Oh yes, God blesses us with our material and physical needs. But remember, He also blesses the non-believers. There are a lot of non-believers who are healthy and wealthy. With their physical and material needs. And that is not why Jesus came. He came to save us from our sins. And all these false teachers that are attracting so many people. Who promise the people. If you just have faith in Christ. You can name whatever you want in the name of Jesus Christ. And you will have your fancy car. You will have your mansion. If ever you're sick, just name it and declaim it in the name of Jesus and you will be healed. And many people die. And so they came, come out of this Christianity disillusioned. I prayed. I even fasted and my loved one died. Why? Because Jesus didn't promise. He didn't promise that. He promised salvation from sin to those who believe. When was the last time you hear you hear that from all these false these teachers? You won't. Listen, Jesus didn't even come to make our lives better. Jesus didn't even come to make our lives better. He came to give us life. Not to make our lives better. He came to give us life because we are all dead in sin. Jesus came to give us life and to bring, to, to, for us to have it in abundance that He said in John chapter 10, verse 10. Abundant life. And that is abounding with joy and peace in spite of the troubles that we go through in life. A quality of life that is not dependent on the abundance of, or lack of material things or the condition of our physical health. God wants us to abound with all the virtues of life that we long for in spite of the situations or conditions of life here on earth. And that is what God gave us in Christ. In Christ we have the victory 
over all these things, for He has overcome the world. This is a quality of life that only children of God possesses because of the Savior who was born in Bethlehem. This is the good news of great joy of Christmas. There is a Savior, and He was born about 2,000 years ago, and His name is Jesus. His very name, Yeshua, declares, The Lord is my salvation. As Matthew 1, 21 says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because He will save His people from their sins. But the sinner needs to call on His name the name of the Lord, and believe in His name to be saved. As Romans 10.13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And in Acts 16.31, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. How can this baby who was born in a manger save us? Well, because this baby did not remain a baby in a manger, the baby grew up to be a man and was crucified on a cross where he died for your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world. He took the penalty, that is the payment, the condemnation of our sins. He took it upon himself and bore our sins. And he paid it all with his precious and sinless blood. So that whoever will believe in Him, whoever puts their faith in Him, will not perish, will not be condemned ever, will not die, but have eternal life. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. How can He say? Because He is the Christ. He is Christ. This points to His identification. Who is the Savior? He is Christ. Christ means the anointed of God, the Messiah, the deliverer who will deliver us from our sins. Jesus, the Savior, is the Christ, the one who was prophesied, anointed as in chosen of God, anointed to be king, to rule and reign in our hearts and in our lives, anointed to be our high priest, to represent us to God anointed to be the prophet of God, to speak to us the word of God, who himself is the word of God. He is Christ. And not only is Christ, it says there, he is the Lord. The Lord. This points to his exaltation. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Though he went through the humiliation in his becoming a helpless little baby, which is true humanity, we see his exaltation in his being Lord, that is, undiminished deity. Jesus did not cease or stop being God. He just clothed his deity with humanity, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. The baby that was born is Christ, the Lord. The Lord as in Yahweh, Jehovah, God, God in the flesh. That's who Jesus is. The Son of God whom the Father exalted equal to Himself as Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 to 11 declares. Therefore God that is the Father also has I exalted Him that is Christ the Son and given Him the name which is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those of earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. And that's no longer a title. That Lord is now His name. Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yet the Lord, the Lord Almighty God, put on humanity and became man. So he can be what? He can be with us. As Matthew 1, 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive or shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And when you believe in him, he becomes God in you. God in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the good news of great joy for all. 
It is a good news because if Jesus was not born, we don't have a Savior. There's none of this. You can have all the trees and all the lights. We're all still going to an eternity without Christ. But thank God He came. If He didn't come, we will still be in our sins, lost and helpless and hopeless, because no amount of good works that we do can satisfy the perfect standard of a holy and righteous God that He requires. Even if we sincerely attempt to please God with all the good works that we know, we all fall short. And because of that, we will pay the penalty of our sins, which is eternal separation from God who is holy, eternally condemned in an eternal place called hell. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the good news. There is a Savior. As one song says, there is a Savior. What joys express. His eyes are mercy and His word is rest. For each tomorrow and for yesterday, there is a Savior and He lies our way. Are there burdens in your heart? Is your past a memory that binds you? Is there some pain that, you're, that you have carried far too long? Then strengthen your heart with this good news. There is a Savior and He has forgiven you. But you need to believe in Him in your heart. You need to trust in Him. Put your faith in Jesus the Lord. If you put your faith in Him, you don't have to pay for your sins and suffer eternal separation from God because Jesus paid it all for you with His own sinless blood when He died on the cross. This is the good news of great joy. That is why we are glad for Christmas, knowing this, that Christ the Savior is born, is more than enough reason for us to have a Merry Christmas. As a matter of fact, more than a Merry Christmas. With this good news, we ought to have a joyous Christmas, a joy-filled Christmas, a gladness that is not dependent on the food, the lights, the presents, or anything else, but mainly and purely because a Savior is born, who is Christ the Lord. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas, but more than a Merry Christmas, a joyful Christmas. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Although we have heard and read the story so many times, O oh Lord, it's easy for us not only to be distracted, forgetful, but be affected by all it, all, all the, uh, the busyness and all that the world goes through in a time like this. And we lose, how to, we lose our focus indeed. But we thank you because you are faithful, our faithful and good shepherd who not only watches over us, but guides us, leads us, speaks to us through your Holy Spirit. Words that we need, even words that will convict us. Because now as children of God, you are to be the reason not only for the season, but the reason for our lives, the reason why we are here, why we live. And so as you have spoken to us, Lord God, may you be the one not only to bring conviction, but repentance from whatever it is, Lord God, that have drawn us away from you, our sins, and turn to you, especially in this Christmas time so that truly we may give to you the worship that is due and worthy of your name and use us to tell others this good news of great joy that you have given even for them. And now I speak to you, whoever you may be. And I don't know who I'm speaking to, but you, you need the Lord and you haven't really received the Lord in your heart. 
you just go to church and you agree with all these things. And you are, in your mind, you're a good person because you have not killed someone or committed some immoral sin. But the Bible says you're still a sinner and you have sinned and you fall short. And because of that sin, you'll spend an eternity away from God in hell unless you come to Him in repentance and call upon the name of the Lord. And you haven't done that. If you haven't made that decision, that acknowledgement that you need Christ and you haven't really called on Him, then I invite you to do that now. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Ask for His forgiveness and thank Him for dying for your sins and paying for your sins. Tell Him that you love Him, that you believe in Him, and that you have decided to follow Him. Lord Jesus, you know who have made those decisions and prayed and called upon your name. And thank you for your salvation to them as you have promised in your word. And now, Lord God, we continue to honor you and worship you, even as we together partake of the Holy Communion. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about